do your marketing, which oftentimes comes with your most expensive opportunities. Um, whether it's not just marketing, it can be capacity. So Jeff Anderman is the CEO and founder of a company called Turning Point, which is based here, and they also have offices in Chicago. Jeff has a, a CFO background, so I'll let him talk about that, because he, he's actually doing two jobs now. So I'll let Jeff introduce himself, and then we're gonna talk through some questions about capital, about how do you raise that, what's the difference between some of those. But Jeff, why don't you start first with just your background. Yeah, sure, sure. So I, um, uh, and Derek's gonna kind of do a Q&A here, because I'm not nearly really as charismatic as some of the speakers that came here before. Uh, but um, uh, so I am actually a uh, attorney by training, uh, so don't fault me for that. Uh, I only did it for two years before I uh, realized that I needed to do something different. Uh, and uh, uh, so, I, so I did it for two years, uh, and then I had uh, I was representing mostly private equity clients who were investing in private companies, um, and I had the opportunity to join a client, um, but in a not legal role as an investment professional, uh, and I spent about three three and a half years. Um, uh, investing in more mature consumer product and food companies. Um, and uh, after about three years of doing that and, and learning a ton, um, I realized I wanted to do something uh, more entrepreneurial. Um, and I had the opportunity to get involved with a company that's based here in town called Infinity Product Group. Uh, and I'm, I'm a partner and CFO of Infinity Product Group. We're a, a wholesaler uh, and a distributor of a number of different products to big box retailers. Um, we do headwear, apparel, accessories, a lot of <coughs> licensed products under uh, lifestyle brands like uh, Chevrolet, Miller, uh, Budweiser, you know, kind of those Joe six pack licenses that make a ton of sense for, um, you know, some of the retailers that are here in town, for example. Um, and then we do a lot of team sports licensed products, so we do stuff under collegiate licenses. Uh, so. Um, uh, if you walk into a Dollar General store, for example, um, uh, and you buy a University of Arkansas mug, um, there is a 100% chance that you're buying that product essentially from us. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's a big part of our business. When I got involved with Infinity uh, four years ago, um, uh, I was involved because, I became involved because uh, the majority owner of the business is a family member, an extended family member of mine. Um, and he had a partner who was ready to retire. Um, and he had some great opportunities to grow the business, uh, but he needed to figure out how to get that partner bought out and how to basically figure out how to grow the business by 400% over the next four years. Um, and uh, he gave me a call and he said, can you help me? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and so we had to figure out at that time how to basically you know, raise some capital uh, to uh, get the partner bought out. Uh, it was a friendly buyout. Um, and then uh, also set the business up for the kind of growth plans that we wanted to achieve over the next four years. Um, we succeeded in doing that. Um, the business has grown uh, significantly. We're actually uh, on the Inc. 5000 list of the top 5,000 fastest growing private companies in, in the U.S. Uh, this year. Um, but what I learned was figuring out how to, how, how to do all that, even for someone with you know, my background, not to pat myself on the back, but I have a finance background, um, was hard. You know, um, and uh, I had to uh, uh, learn a lot along the way to make sure that we were successful. Um, and uh, the light bulb kind of went off, which was, um, is there a way for me to take what I've learned and help folks like you uh, figure out how to finance your business? What's the optimal way to finance your business? Um, it may not always be uh, to go out and do the Shark Tank-like equity raise, um, or um, uh, go call your local banker who, you know, as much as I hate to say it, eight to nine times out of 10 is probably gonna tell you no. Um, so, so that's a little bit about uh, uh, turning point and sort of how I got there. Um, and uh, uh, I guess. That well, what is, we'll talk about equity because he brought up Shark Tank and all of us have seen Shark Tank and you know that they go in there and give away equity for big investments in, in, in their company. But there are different concerns about giving away equity, right. and there, there's, it's really twofold. You have the business owner who has concerns with equity. If I give up so much of it, what do I retain? But also as an equity investor, there are perils that you can dilute that so much. So even if you're investing and, and acquiring equity within a company, in five years, that could be really worth nothing. Correct. Even though the company may still be doing well. So yes. let's talk about the different Yeah, companies. Yeah, so there's a lot to consider. If, if, you're, if you're the CEO of a company or founder of a company, and you're looking to raise equity, there's a lot of things that you need to consider when you do that. Um, you know, the pros, so to speak, to raising equity are typically it's, it's permanent 
capital. You don't have to pay it back on a schedule generally. Now, all this is obviously negotiable, but it's, it's typically permanent capital um, that comes into your business that you can use to grow the business, and you don't necessarily have to return it on a fixed schedule like you might, you know, your home loan mortgage, right? Um, now, that can be great, um, and, and obviously that has its benefits. Um, the things that you have to consider when you're raising equity, though, are you are going to pay that person back, typically, in one form or fashion. Uh, and the way you're paying them back, right, typically is you're saying, you're going to give me half a million dollars, and in exchange for that, I'm going to give you 25% of my company. And that means that they're going to enjoy and participate in 25% of the profits, you know, sort of in perpetuity, right, absent some other extenuating circumstance down the road. Um, and if you have the opportunity to sell your business uh, in the future um, and, and generate, you know, what we describe as kind of a liquidity event, they're going to be participating in that as well. Um, so, so you're giving up, you know, a portion of the profits of your business at a time when, you know, you don't really know what that's going to be. Um, and so, you know, coming from the equity investor world, um, I will tell you that equity investors typically target a annual return on their money starting at 20%. I mean, compare that to what you pay for your, your bank loan, right? Uh, which is, these days can be as low as, you know, five, six, seven percent. Um, that should tell you a lot about how expensive that money can be um, in the grand scheme of things. Um, obviously, the other thing you have to consider is when you take on an equity investor, you're, you're, now you have a partner, um, and you have all the complications that can come with that. Um, so, you know, yes, that person might bring things to the table uh, that can help you grow your business, but you've got another voice at the table uh, that you have to uh, sort of collaborate with and also work with. Um, so those are those are the kind of the big things to consider um, uh, as a um, as a potential founder taking on an equity partner. With tech firms, you hear a lot about getting raising capital to go and invest in a tech firm. That's computer code. I mean, in all reality, you're building a program. With CPG it becomes much more complex. It does. You guys have had to do this because there's also your capacity, your production. If you're if you're producing yourself, what's the time? What what's equipment is needed? Uh, John, he mentioned his robots. People thought he was absolutely crazy to put robots into his fulfillment center. Obviously, it turned out well for John. But that's a big capital expenditure that he's had to invest. So for all of you who are doing CPG, you've got a lot more to worry about than computer code. And design, designing an app and getting the app out there. It's about product, it's about marketing. And so talk about some of the struggles with yes. trying to raise money for that because bankers aren't eager to give you money. Yeah, I mean, so, so and I don't say this to discourage anybody, but, but CPG businesses compared to tech companies um, can be, you know, capital hogs, so to speak. Um, uh, you know, a tech company, think about John's business for a minute. Um, you know, the two biggest components of his cost, set aside the robots and all that stuff, two biggest components of his cost structure, what was causing him to burn cash, were his people, right? Because um, he has his programmers and his marketing folks. And then the money he was spending on advertising, probably with his Facebook experiments and pay-per-click experiments and all that. <clears throat> if you're a CPG firm, you're likely to have all those expense categories as well. But in addition to that, you're going out and you're having to make products. Um, and I'm sure as some of you have found um, when you're working, a lot of you I would imagine are working with contract manufacturers or co-packers. Um, a lot of times they expect you to pay for your product up front. Um, or they'll say, hey, I can only make 10,000 at a time, I'm not going to do 144 units for you. Um, and so then all of a sudden, you're ordering 10,000 units, um, and maybe you're only selling, you know, 100 a week or 100 a month, right? Um, so you're having to put the money out there for that inventory um, uh, before you have the sales, right? Um, so that's, that's a huge capital, you know, sort of uh, intensive uh, process there. And then as you start selling to retailers, um, you know, you're going to find that um, uh, the Walmarts and the Targets and the Myers in the world, you know, they don't, their payment terms are what they tell you they are. Um, and, uh, and generally they're not paying you when the, when the goods show up at the distribution center. Um, they're paying you 30, 60, 90 days later. Um, and while you're waiting for that money to come in, you need to go out and buy the next round of inventory or pay the folks that you have working for you um, or uh, invest in some marketing to drive some folks to the store to buy your product. Um, so that's what's particularly challenging about product-based businesses is, is you have receivables and inventory that you have to carry 
um, you know, the second you sell that product for 100 bucks, you don't have 100 bucks in your bank account, unfortunately. There are different types of finance. Well, this goes into marketing too, because mm -hmm. that, that's probably one of the biggest expenses that most of you are going to incur. You don't even know you have to incur it. And you won't know it until you go to a retailer and they ask you, what are you gonna to do to promote this product? I'm gonna put it on your shelf. You have 100 million people a week coming in your store, that should be what I need to do. It's not what's gonna happen and you're, you've got a very short time you're gonna be on there unless you're able to create some buzz, pull it off. But marketing, raising marketing capital is not yes. so easy because you're investing, and you can talk about this, but you're really investing in a campaign that's gone. I, I used to work in radio and television, and radio and TV, they sell air. That's it. And once it's gone, and it's gone. So how do you raise money for capital? Yeah, I mean, so, for marketing? Yeah, so, so Derek raises a great point, and, and I think the key, one of the key points that you just made is, is you have to make sure that that's part of your plan, right? So you need to budget for that when you're figuring out, here's what I need from a capital perspective. Um, and if you're just if you're just getting into retail, um, your, your your marketing plan and I'm not a sales and marketing person, and, and so I, I could be saying something stupid here. And if I am, the folks with the sales and marketing background, please please kick me or throw a, a spitball at me or something. But um, um, I think TJ's presentation highlighted well, which is your plan when you're getting on the shelf for the first time does not need to be I need to take out five thousand billboards across the United States and spend half a million dollars. Right? Um, you need to budget money for it, but it's got to be smart money, and it's got to be um, uh, a plan that is going to get you the most bang for your money. Now, <clears throat> when you put that into your plan, um, you know what we, what you need to figure out when you create that plan is is here's how much capital I need for marketing, for inventory, for people, for you know just working capital. Um, and then, you know, what we do, do at Turning Point is help you figure out, okay, what's, what's the best plan for me to go out and get that money, right? Is it some combination of, uh, you know, debt financing with equity financing? Um, and if you're going out and you're looking for equity, um, your plan and your story has to be uh, as tight as it possibly can be. Um, you know, for those of you who watch Shark Tank, uh, I occasionally watch it, I don't love it, but I do watch it from time to time. Uh, uh, knowing your numbers, knowing your plan, I mean, that's extremely important when you're talking to potential equity investors. One of the things that I consistently hear, when somebody puts a marketing budget together, double it or triple it, and you're in the ballpark. Right. If you assume it's gonna be a nickel per unit, you're probably off by about 15 cents. Yeah. And how often do you guys see that? I mean, you're building your own, you're doing your own with CP, with uh, yes. Infinity. Yes. Let's talk about the marketing budget that you guys have had to come up with and, and what surprised you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're fortunate in that some of the products that we do, um, uh, there is a built-in following, you know, with some of the stuff we do because it's licensed, right? So so we put an Arkansas Razorbacks product into a Walmart store or a a Dollar General store, a Target store. Um, there's a built-in following there, uh, so we're able to piggyback off some of that, right? But <clears throat> when we have done marketing, um, uh, it's been around social, uh, it's been around trade shows, it's been around in-store promotions. Um, it does add up fast, you know, it really does. Uh, and um, uh, the biggest thing is, is making sure that um, you're getting the ROI for, uh, for what you're spending. Uh, so I would, a little bit of marketing advice, again, getting out of my daily work here, but, um, you know, test small, right? You know, um, um, you know if, if you're thinking about doing something in a big way, test it small first, you know? Um, if you're doing, doing in-store promo, test it in a couple stores, you know, 50 stores, 100 stores. See if it works before you blow it up, uh, and then you can't go back and, and get your money back because it didn't work. That's another thing that I've seen consistently at the beginning of talking with different people is that, first of all, there's promotional spend and trade spend. Promotional spend is what you're going to spend in the public to create a kind of poll. Trade spend is what you will spend with the retailer in terms of cost of goods. Make sure you know the difference between those and you play those differently. So you have a list price, your best customer is going to get trade spend dollars, which is off list price, but you still have to reserve money for promotional spend. So when you see your coupons that hit the mail, you see TV advertising, you see social media advertising, that's promotional spend, not the trade spend. Right. Oftentimes, as an early stage CPG company, you want to just get on the shelf, so you wind up giving them the best deal, and you're going to talk to, you're going to hear from some buyers 
a little bit later today, the last thing they're going to let you do is come back in 30 days, 60 days into this and say, oh, my, I need to spend more money on promotional, so I'm giving you a cost increase. Yeah. I won't fly so well. <laughs> no. They can, they can solve that problem for you by putting it on clearance and co-opting you for some markdown dollars, and then you don't have to worry about that again. So make sure you're budgeting that in and, and do your research. Find out. I mean, collective bias is here. You can talk to Bill later. But there's a social media company right there. You can go get an idea of what it's going to cost you to run. about the difference between debt and equity finance? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, at a high level, you know, equity is, like we talked about a little bit earlier, equity is, is when you raise money from an investor uh, by basically selling an ownership stake in your business. Um, you know, debt obviously is, is a loan, right? So it's, it's uh, someone is going to give you money um, uh, with a set of terms that require you to pay that money back, typically over time with interest. Um, now, <clears throat> when you start getting into the CPG world, um, um, and you're starting to carry things like inventory and accounts receivable with very creditworthy customers like Walmart and Target, uh, some of these big retailers that are out there, um, uh, there's a whole universe of, of options available to you beyond sort of the typical uh, uh, go get an investor um, or go to my local bank, go to Harvest and, and see if I can get um, you know, $100,000 loan to help for my business. Um, you know, there are a number of uh, what I would describe as non-traditional lenders who um, are very active uh, and lending to CPG businesses that have um, uh, you know good customer bases. Um, so we can we can talk a little bit about that more specifically, Derek, if you want. Um, uh, maybe a couple of flavors of that if you think it's it's helpful. You talked about the twenty percent return on equity. Yes. What is debt financing? What is that? Say? Yeah, it just it really it really varies. Um, you know, when you're a new business and you're starting out, let's say let me give you an example. So, let's say uh, uh, you just got into uh, a big retailer for the first time. Um, and uh, they've given you a large purchase order. Um, and uh, the problem you have is, okay, uh, this is a $2 million purchase order, let's call it, and it's gonna cost me a million dollars just to produce these goods with my supplier. Um, and, uh, and my supplier, um, uh, as great as a relationship as we have, is gonna require me to you know, give him some of the money now uh, when I place the order, and then uh, maybe pay for the rest of it when I have to use my supplier's dock to come to me or to come to Wal to Walmart or whoever. Um, so that's a that's a tough problem to have, right? I mean, it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. You've got this this great order, um, but maybe you don't have a million bucks sitting in your bank account uh, to go out and, and produce that product. Um, so you know, one of the solutions that's available in that situation is uh, a financing product called purchase order financing. Uh, and in purchase order financing. Um, a purchase order financing company uh, will basically say, um, uh, I see you've got a great purchase order here. Um, I see you've, uh, you've got a great customer here that's gonna take this product from you. Um, <clears throat> uh, I see that you, you know, have a history here of producing this product and you've got a good supplier. And, um, so what we will do is we will either advance directly to your supplier on your behalf, you know, the cost of goods uh, to get that order produced. Um, or we will basically tell your supplier, please go ahead and fill this order, uh, and we'll guarantee that you get paid for it when you ship it. Um, now, that kind of financing um, can can look pretty expensive. Um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if you compare it to you know the 30-year fixed mortgage payment that you're, you're making right now. Um, so, you know, something like that, a typical structure, just to give you an idea, is if they have to put a payment guarantee or an advance in place to your supplier, let's just get, say it takes 60 days for them to produce it. Um, if they say, okay, supplier, get started, 60 days later, uh, you know, we're gonna pay you the million bucks to get that, that product produced, you know, that might cost you anywhere from, you know, one and a half to two percent of that million dollars every month that that's outstanding. So if you start doing the math in your head, you know, you're, you're thinking, okay, that's, that's kind of like a, you know, 15, 20% interest rate, you know, annualized. You know, that seems expensive, right? Um, but <clears throat> the second that you get that order produced and filled, um, uh, you know, you, you've now got a $2 million receivable and you've got a, half, uh, a million dollar profit sitting on your books and you look great, right? 
Um, and hopefully the next time you won't have to use the purchase order financing company because you now got money in the, in the bank to hopefully go out and do the next round of orders. Um, and uh, while that looks expensive on its face, you know, 18 to 20 percent uh, interest rate, um, you haven't sold any equity in the company, hopefully, right? Um, so the next time that you do the deal, um, uh, the next time you fill an order with Walmart, you know, all that profit's yours. Um, uh, so that's, you know, that's pretty compelling, right? Um, uh, so that's an example, of that, and that is probably the most expensive, expensive debt financing product out there. So how do you find, if you're looking for, for equity investors, you're looking for debt financing or PO financing, how do you find the companies that do that? Uh, come talk to me. <laughs> um, no, no. Uh, uh, so there are. If you were, if you were to leave this room right now and, and pull out your phone or, or uh, uh, your laptop and, and search for purchase order financing, or search for accounts receivable financing, you'd see tons of results. Um, um, you know, the question, the question I think you have to ask yourself when you start to see that is, is who are the ones that I can trust? Who's reputable? Um, who, you know, if I call this person, will they pick up the phone? Um, do they understand my business? Um, so, you know, a little bit of a, a little bit of a sales pitch here, but but what what we do is um, particularly for this space is you know we have six to eight vetted relationships of people who do these things um, and who have a track record and uh, are reputable. Um, and so, you know, typically what we like to do is is um, work with young CPG companies like yourselves and say, um, let's figure out what you think you need, let's look at the big picture of, of, of what we can offer potential financing sources, and then we're gonna marry you up with what we think is the best fit for you. Um, so that's, that's in a nutshell kind of how we work. Well, Jeff is gonna have, he has to fly out today, and, and so he's got about eight minutes left. I wanna give you a chance to ask some questions if, if you've got something. Because uh, you're not going to be able to connect with him once he's done, because he's got to go to the At airport. least in person, but I can... I David, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question, Jeff. Just, yes. When somebody's looking for equity and then they bring their whole project and such to you, and a lot of it's based on projections, what are the keys that you and your investors look at to make it so that it's more believable? Because anybody can put projections out there. So sure. as they look at it, say, well, you know, here's we, we agree with you. What are the keys that you can help people to make it more, you know, a believable story. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> so when you're building projections, um, I think there's a couple things you got to think about. Um, it's I'm a big proponent of building what I would call bottoms up projections, which are um, here's my product. Um, uh, hopefully, you have a story to tell around um, uh, the sell throughs and, and the product sales that you've been able to generate maybe in a smaller retail, retail chain or a smaller retail environment or online. Um, so you have some history there to uh, uh, sort of tell a story around, here's the, here's the velocity that we think we can achieve once we get on the shelf, right? Um, and uh, using that, I think you, you basically take that and, and if you can extrapolate it um, to the point where you can say, you know, okay, we're doing two units a store, two units per store per week, on average now. Um, and if we can get it into you know, another couple hundred stores uh, and maintain that, that sales rate, um, you know, here's what that looks like in terms of dollars. Now, <clears throat> if, you, if I'm sitting across from you as a potential investor and you're telling me that, I'm gonna be sort of betting everything you're saying through the prism of, uh, uh, is, there, is that history really there? Is it repeatable? Uh, is the person I'm talking to, do they have you know, sort of some track record experience and, and, and have they been successful in doing things like this previously, or do I think they could if they haven't? Um, you know, so it's it's really a combination of of, of all those things. Um, so it's 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 evaluating the person as well as the projection. Is that, I don't know if that's helpful or not. But. And maybe just to expand on that, how do you prove up that it's you know repeatable? What are the things you look at? Because it's real as somebody that's one or two hundred stores, yep. and then to take it nationwide. What can they do to, to prove that it's repeatable? Because that's the real key is, is everybody knows, for, not everybody, but most of the time you know your cost. It's yep. that sales number that yep. is hard to, hard to reach to. So how do you prove up to investors that it is, in fact, repeatable? Yeah, I think you have to, you have to sell the history, sell the story around the history. 
You have to look for um, uh, similar products and find out as much as you can about how those products have performed at retail. Um, and that can be, you know, as much as, you know, finding, not necessarily a competitor, but maybe a similar or analogous product. And then finding out who distributes those products, who sells those products, you know. Figure out any way you can to get some metrics, even if it's just anecdotal, around how those products perform at retail. Um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, for example, TJ, you probably have a pretty good sense of, of how some other waters sell, you know, at retail. Small companies, Coke, Pepsi. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that would that would be my advice: is, is get as many data points as you can to substantiate your story. Um, uh, you know, that that would probably be my, my best advice. And that that really comes getting that information really comes from you know finding out who the other players are, finding out who's distributing them, um, finding ways to network into talking to someone who you know. Um, uh, has experience selling those similar products and can give you a sense for how they're doing at retail. Thanks. Anybody else? Have you ever find somebody who, uh, a product that you would like to license because you feel like it falls into that model? Now that's your infinity group, mm -hmm. that's turning point, but do you, um, would you take a percentage of the licensing fee? You know? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, we get approached about that a lot, actually. Uh, Probably doesn't surprise you. What was the uh, question? Oh yeah, um, she asked that a uh, uh, little bit unrelated to the capital conversation. Um, if um, uh, she has a product where she thinks um, a, a license that one of the licenses that Infinity has would be very relevant for her product, um, if uh, uh, we would work to help them essentially get that license, you know, either broker a deal or connect them or, or something like that. That's something we get approached about a lot, and we're certainly open to having those conversations. Um, uh, you know, the licensors, um, just to give you a flavor for how that works, the licensors are um, typically very hesitant to take on um, newish companies, newish products, particularly if they're um, one or two SKU uh, companies, just because, um, uh, the, you know, the track record's not, it's the same thing, right? They're looking at it almost like a bank. You know, you don't have a track record. Um, uh, why, would I, why would I go through all the administrative headache to bring you on? Uh, you know, when you've got kind of just a couple of SKUs and you know, they're not nationwide yet or anything like that. Um, and in, in those cases, a lot of times they often say, if you were to approach them directly, they might even send you out away um, to see if we can help you. Okay, final question. Great. Brian. Okay, let's say you're a company and you're a startup. You put a pretty good amount of money into your company. Okay. Uh, are, you, are you asking for a friend or? <laughs> <laughs> and you have, you have proof of uh, success. You basically know the market is great for it, and uh, but you don't have sales yet. You're just about to basically hit the market, but you need a amount of funding to well hit the large levels you want to get to. Yes. How do you come about coming to a number of what you think your company is worth, or uh, the amount of money you're going to need? Uh, Sure. What sure. advice would you give on that? Because I know it's harder when you obviously don't have sales, but. Yeah, so let me start with the, the second part of your question, which is how much are we going to need? Because uh, that's a little easier to answer. Um, uh, so uh, what I would recommend in that instance is um, I, would, I would basically, I'd build a projection, right? So I'd say, um, here's what I think I can do on the low side. Here's what I think I can do on the high side. Here's what I can do on the medium side. Right, um, and, and you'll probably find that when you start to do that projection, that uh, counterintuitively, if you hit the high side, you're probably going to need more money than if you hit the low side. Um, so that's kind of where I would start. That's that's a kind of a very high level answer to uh, a big question um, in terms of of what uh, what what how you value your company at this point in time. That's always a challenge. That's really that's really more art than science. Um, but, but what I would recommend um, is uh, uh, start looking around uh, for other companies, again, yep. um, who have raised money, uh, who might be somewhat similar to you, and it may raise money at a similar stage. Um, and uh, then you start to tell a story around, okay, this comparable company over here raised this much at this valuation, and um, uh, we think that we're similar for these five reasons. Uh, and that's how we're going to set our evaluation. But there's a little bit of just some of this to it. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much. Yeah.